So uh, welcome everyone to uh, So You Want to Be Well Architected. My name is Brian Farnhill. I'm a solutions architect with AWS based here in Canberra. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Solution Architects, we're the uh, sort of technical guys that, uh, that we talk to on the sales side of things, but uh, my job is really to get in and help customers uh, sort of optimise and get the best out of what they're doing with AWS. And the well-architected framework plays a key part in that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So this here is uh, Dr. Werner Vogels. He's our CTO. And one of his favourite questions, despite the fact that it's blatantly photoshopped onto this photo, is, are you well-architected? And it's a common question that we talk to uh, customers about. Uh, Glenn brought it up during the keynote around the, his whole concept of re-architecting when we migrate workloads into the cloud. We like to make sure that customers are really optimizing how they run their workloads in the cloud and getting the most out of the services and the features and the security that comes with using the AWS cloud. So what specifically is the AWS well-architected framework? Essentially, it's a, a questionnaire of sorts that's made up of uh, different pillars and we have a lot of design principles that go throughout it. And we work through those with you to sort of assess how you're operating your workloads in the cloud. Uh, we target a number of different areas to sort of really flesh out um, what it is that you're doing with your workloads and where you could make potential improvements to, to make sure that you're getting the best out of, out of what you're doing in AWS. Um, we talk to customers about why would you want to apply the well-architected framework. And there's a number of good reasons for it. Uh, first of all, applications that are built following the, the sort of principles that we talk about in the well-architected framework are typically uh, built and deployed faster. We follow a lot of uh, DevOps-based principles and uh, we have a number of services to help you facilitate that. Um, so we find that customers can get their applications out there sooner. Uh, we talk about lowering or mitigating risks so the well-architected framework is the result of the many years that AWS has had out in the field talking to customers, um, understanding their workloads, and bringing that together into a, a consolidated format so that you can benefit from those years of experience in the kinds of questions that we're asking and the best practices that we're trying to drive. It's about also helping you make informed decisions. So when you get, go through a well-architected review, uh, one of the things that you'll find is that maybe not every single best practice is practical to your business. You might find that your workload, for some reason or another, is not necessarily molded to every single rule. But it's about being able to provide you context around why we ask the questions, risks that you're trying to mitigate, so that you can then make informed decisions for yourself about how your workloads run. And, uh, and ultimately, it's all based around the AWS best practices, so practices that come from us and from our knowledge of customers. So when we talk to the well-architected framework, there are five pillars that you'll see us go through. The first is operational excellence. We have security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. And so each one of these pillars has a number of different questions that we'll ask you designed to get you thinking about these various different pillars and elements within them and ways that your application sort of you know, can be improved or where it is doing well or where it, uh, where it needs some work so that you get a really good understanding. Now, this is more focused on the, the cloud uh, infrastructure and the, the services that you're using. We're not going to get into you know, what language have you used and what specific framework in your application have you used. It's more about the principles that apply to operating broadly across, across the cloud. Because you know, people have been writing applications for many, many years and there's lots of good practices for people out there to follow and people understand how to, to create applications. The cloud bit's the new bit. Right? That's the part that we really want to help customers learn about and be able to optimise as they move things forward. So how do you do a well-architected review? There are two ways to go about it. The first one is you can go and do it yourself. We make all the materials available uh, through a series of white papers that are on our website. You can download them, you get the questionnaires in full, and you can go through and do your own assessment on your workloads. Now, the second option, uh, for those of you who uh, have an account team that has a solution architect, such as myself in it, um, you can actually get us to come in and do the well-architected review for you. And that's something that we'll do at no cost. So we're able to come and uh, work with you through these questionnaires, uh, ask probing questions, get you really thinking about where your applications are, are doing well and where there's room for improvement and, and bring that wealth of knowledge and expertise into your environment and into your workloads. So there's a, a couple of different ways that you can go about it. 
So when we talk about the questions in Well Architected, they're made up of a few different parts. Um, we break them into different pillars, and then within that, um, we'll have the question text, so this is the reliability, and it says, how are you managing your AWS service limits for your accounts? The next thing we have is we have some context, because it's one thing to ask a question, but we like to make sure that you understand why we're asking that question. So the context for this one is around, you know, we have default service limits. Do you know they were there? Uh, have you requested increases? Do you need increases? Uh, so this gives you some background about why we ask each of the questions that we ask. Um, and then from that, each question has a series of best practices, so things that you can look at to get the conversation going. You know, are we following these? Uh, if so, great. If not, why not? Should we be? Uh, and it's a really great way to get that conversation going when you start reviewing your applications. So when you sit down and look at the well-architected framework, there's a number of general design principles that you'll see throughout all five of those pillars. Um, things around being able to stop guessing your capacity needs, uh, which is something that again got mentioned through the keynote a couple of times. Uh, being able to, to test your systems at production scale. Show of hands, who's got dev and test environments that don't have the same hardware as production because you've been undercutting on hardware? There's a few hands that go up, it's, it's a fairly common thing. Um, you know, with the cloud, we can do that. Bring your test environments up, run your tests, and then turf them when you're done. Only pay for the time you're testing. Um, looking at automation, and automation is a key concept that you'll see throughout the well-architected review in all pillars for ways to automate responses to all sorts of different events to make running your applications easier. We'll talk about allowing for evolutionary architectures. So again, Glenn mentioned during the keynote that we had over 1,430 new feature releases or updates last year. Now, chances are that your application is going to benefit from at least a few of them. Um, so creating an application once and not looking at it again, not necessarily a great option. So we'll ask you questions around what are your processes like for evolving your architectures? Um, driving your architecture using data. You know, we love data at Amazon. Uh, data points are something that we feed off. And, one of the, and we'll ask you a lot of questions around what data points do you use when making decisions about your architecture? And, uh, and we'll also bring up the concept of game days a lot. Um, was anyone here for the game day that we did yesterday, just out of curiosity? Anyone in the room? No? So uh, a game day is sort of a, we run a, a sort of mock system and some mock events so that you can practice responding to various different things that uh, can go wrong in certain circumstances to get hands-on experience with um, how to respond to different events and incidents and make sure that your, your processes that you have in place for responding to an event will actually work. So those are our general design principles. So what I'm going to do for the, the remainder of this talk is take you through each pillar and just sort of introduce the principles that we're looking at specifically for each pillar and then sort of give you a couple of examples around things that we might ask specifically about for each one. So let's start with operational excellence. So the, the three key concepts we really try to drive home in the operational excellence pillar are around being prepared, how you operate, and how you evolve. So being prepared is something that we're all used to. You know, before you take a system live, you'll do your, your testing, your preparation, you'll do everything you can to make sure that it's good to go. Operating, also not a new concept. We have operations teams, we know how to monitor things, but you know, making sure we're monitoring the right things and being aware of all the different data points that you have about your application. But the last one, and I feel that this is the most important one here, is evolving. You know, having actual processes in place to facilitate evolution of how you operate your applications. So things that we look at in this pillar specifically are things like performing operations with code. Right? So the concept of infrastructure as code and configuration as code, using services like CloudFormation, so that you can automate and iterate and repeat is something that we'll, uh, we'll talk about in the operations space. Annotating documentation. Right, so integrating documentation with those code elements so that it's not something that you have to keep up to date afterwards. Again, I asked the room, how many people keep their documentation up to date after the system goes live? Right, it's, it's a fairly common thing that comes up. I won't ask you to raise hands on that one, but it's a, it's a common thing. We looked at making frequent, small, reversible changes. Right? We've got the tools and services to help facilitate that in, and that can help mitigate risk. Rather than these big bang changes where it could have been one of 47 things that went wrong, if I'm making one small change every couple of days, it's really easy to narrow things down if something does go south. Being able to refine your operations procedures frequently. Right, so again, who's written a DR guide and never gone back and reviewed it? Um, being able to go back and say, you know, is this the right thing for the way my application runs today? 
anticipating failure. Um, again, I'll use DR as an example, who's written a DR process and never actually tested the restore. Um, being able to anticipate failure and validate that things work the way that you know that they should. And learning from operational failures. You know, when something goes wrong, what do you do afterwards? Do you sit down and reflect? Do we capture what went wrong? Do we implement things to mitigate it from happening again? So we'll ask those kinds of questions. So an example here to just dive a little deeper is around the concept of operations as code. So developers have been doing you know, this whole continuous integration and continuous deployment thing for quite some time now. But you know, more recently in the industry, we've developed this concept of infrastructure as code. So looking at where I can define my infrastructure in a CloudFormation file, check it into source control, and then automate through a continuous integration process things that you know, can create images for me or deploy those services out, and, uh, and to do so without actually having to manually get involved in, uh, in what's happening with that. So um, <coughs> CloudFormation is a great way for me to be able to stamp out multiple environments, for example. So I create one CloudFormation file, and I deploy it once, and I call that production. I then take that same file and I deploy it again, there's my test environment. I deploy that again, there's dev. All right? Each one of these is taking very little effort on top of the initial description of the infrastructure to be able to go and stand up. Plus then, as I'm making changes to my infrastructure, I just update this file, I keep it up to date. So then if I need to do some sort of disaster activity, I can go and deploy it exactly as it was from the latest version of that text file. All right, so the security pillar. Now, uh, again, this is one that we spend a lot of time talking to customers about because security being a very key uh, component to people uh, operating workloads in the cloud. There are a number of different uh, principles that we talk to here. Uh, identity is where we uh, like to begin that conversation. One of the first things that comes up with any customer running a workload in the cloud is how we're we managing security and identity, no matter what type of workload it is. So we like to make sure that you've got a well-documented, understood, and, uh, and something that meets your goals in terms of your identity framework. We talk to having specific detective controls, so things that will find out when something has gone wrong. Uh, we'll talk about infrastructure protection and how we put the walls up to help make sure that your environment stays as secure as it can. We ask you questions around data protection. You know, are we encrypting data at rest? Are we encrypting it in transit? Um, how are we managing that sort of process? And we ask you questions as well around incident response. What do you do when you find out that you have a security incident? How does your team respond to it? What tools do they need? All right, so we'll ask a lot of questions around those kinds of themes throughout the security pillar. So uh, some examples of design principles at work there. Um, implementing a strong identity foundation. Now this could be using our IAM service for identity, or you could be doing something like federating in from an existing identity source. Uh, for example, I know a lot of customers are using uh, ADFS for Active Directory authentication into AWS. Um, that's a great option for having that single sign-on. Enabling traceability. So if I need to figure out what went wrong from a security standpoint, do I have the logs and data that I need to be able to understand what's gone wrong? And services like CloudTrail can help you out there where it logs every call made to the AWS APIs in your account. Applying security at all layers. Again, Glenn mentioned this during the keynote. We see that customers, when they move to the cloud, folk shift their focus from just protecting the perimeter to wanting to protect every single layer of the application. So we'll talk to how you do defense in depth and how you've applied different strategies within your application and workload. Automating security best practices is another good one, um, and I recommend you hang about for Ben's session this afternoon around automating security responses for some good practical examples in that one. Um, protecting data in transit and rest, I mentioned and also preparing for security events. All right? So making sure that you have the tools, processes, and people in place and aware of what to do when a security event comes up so that you can respond to it as quickly as possible. So the one I wanted to drill down in here was around ubiquitous encryption, right? having your data encrypted everywhere. As this is something that I recommend to pretty much all of my customers. So let's say, for example, that uh, you know, data is coming into AWS. It comes in through our load balances. Um, we've got HTTPS endpoints for all of our APIs. So data is encrypted at that point. And it runs off into any number of our services. Could be S3, could be EBS volumes, it could be RDS, our database service, uh, Redshift, it could be Glacier, you name it. Now, I've protected the data in transit at that point. But each of these services also have options to say encrypt the data at rest to make sure that as the data hits physical disks, it stays encrypted. Now, <clears throat> going further than that, 
there's some other options around what I could do to manage the keys for those encryption. So KMS is our key management server. And it allows you to generate keys that you can use for encrypting data within AWS. And it also gives you the option to bring your own keys from your own key management infrastructure. So uh, we put a lot of control in your hands about how you can encrypt that data in REST within AWS. And then the great thing about all of that is it all gets logged. Right? So CloudTrail is uh, going to audit all the calls made to those keys so that you can see when those keys are used to decrypt data. All right, so let's talk about the reliability pillar. So in terms of reliability, we're talking about how we keep your applications up. So you know, good foundational things like having multiple servers, taking advantage of our availability zones to make sure that you've got uh, your workloads running across multiple physical locations within one region. We'll talk to questions around change management, right, and how do you deploy updates to your applications? How do you minimize downtime during those? And we'll also ask you questions around failure management. You know, if I deploy an update, how do I respond when it doesn't go, right? If the update fails, what do I do? So, uh, so those are the kinds of things that we'll talk to here. So some examples of this, testing your recovery procedures, right? Actually standing up a copy of your, your environment, restoring your data into it, and verifying that your backups work and your processes are okay and everybody's comfortable with the procedures. Talking about automatically recovering from failure. So things like our auto-scaling groups. If you're running a, web, a set of web servers in an auto-scaling group and one of the instances fails, having it automatically spin up another instance so that your web application is, you know, maybe slows down for a short period while the new instance comes up and then is responding again fully without you having to manually interact with it. Scaling horizontally to improve availability. Uh, so horizontal scaling is, uh, again, we talk to our auto-scaling groups, but adding multiple instances to account for load when you need it. Um, stop guessing your capacity. Again, really focusing in on this concept of when I need more servers, add them then, and when I don't need them, take them away. And that latter concept is probably the more important one because that's going to make sure that we keep your costs nice and low. And, uh, and managing change through automation comes back up here again, so being able to automate those releases and, and processes. So an example that I wanted to talk to here is around ways that you can manage different levels of availability in a workload that's running in AWS. So let's say, for example, I have a basic web app that has a single web server and a database server as a starting point. I could run those in EC2, put them in the same availability zone, and based on the SLA on EC2, I get 99% uptime. Two nines, not too bad. But when you start needing to drive that availability up and reduce the number of minutes per month that your application can be out, so maybe we move to three nines, I'll look to run my application across two availability zones. This is something we recommend to, to most customers so that if there's some sort of networking issue that prevents one availability zone from being available temporarily, your application's running in a separate physical location. Uh, this is also true if there's like uh, you know, a fire and one of the buildings burns down, you're running in an, a separate location. But if I start to look to drive things a little further, and maybe I'm looking for four nines, this is where I would start leveraging three availability zones. And it's worth highlighting, we do have three availability zones in the Sydney region. So this is where I would say, maybe let's put 50% of my required capacity into each one of these availability zones. Because what this means is that if there's a failure in any individual availability zone, I can still meet 100% of my application's demand and my users don't notice any kind of outage. So that means I'm really starting to hone this down because when you get to four nines, I think you're talking about four minutes a month of downtime. So you really don't want to be suffering application downtime from an outage because you need those four minutes for patching potentially. But then when you need to start looking at driving things further, we can start leveraging multi-regions. If I'm using CloudFormation to spin up my application, I can take that CloudFormation, CloudFormation to maybe Singapore being the next closest region and spin up the exact same infrastructure in exactly the same way and start leveraging things like uh, Route 53 for sending people to the, most, uh, to the closest instance of your service. And then you're starting to leverage that global framework and having higher levels of availability for your applications. So some food for thought and how you want to manage that. <clears throat> Performance efficiency is our fourth pillar. So here, this is where we start talking to things like, how did you choose that size of VM? How did you choose that service that was going to be right for your application? What were the factors that drove you to deciding that that was the VM you were going to use? Once you've made that decision, do you go back and review it? Do you six months later say, you know what, that VM hasn't really been running very high at all. We could probably downsize that 
or that VM's been running hot since we turned it on, should we make it bigger? What's your process for going through and doing this kind of review? Um, what monitoring tools are you putting in place to be able to inform those decisions? How are you collecting data about your applications and services like CloudWatch play a key component of that within AWS? And lastly, what sort of trade-offs are you looking at making when your architecture is being designed? Because I know I can design the biggest, grandest, all singing, all dancing application in the world, but the trade-off is that that might cost a lot more money than I've got available. All right, so there's always decisions to be made when trying to design what is the optimum application, uh, sorry, what is the optimum architecture for your workload. So when we talk to performance efficiency, some of the design principles that come up here are around being able to democratize advanced technologies. And the one that really comes to mind here is access to a lot of AI and ML services. But this is no longer something that takes um, you know, years to stand up infrastructure, to uh, be able to then necessarily go out and look at training, and then you've got all this massive sunk cost in that, uh, that footprint to be able to do AI just to start performing experiments. All right, I can start making this available to more people in my organization to let them experiment, discover, fail quickly, learn from that, and then innovate. Being able to go global in minutes. So like I said, I could take a CloudFormation template and deploy it into every single one of their 18 regions in the space of a few minutes, and all of a sudden, I've got a global infrastructure. Being able to look at serverless architectures. So this is an interesting one. Things like Lambda for compute as a service, uh, DynamoDB for our uh, NoSQL storage. Uh, there's a plethora more. We could be here for hours if we wanted to list them all. But finding the right serverless architectures to match what your application needs. Uh, being able to experiment more often so again, back to Glenn's point during the keynote, to experiment quickly, reduce the cost of failure, learn and innovate. And, uh, and being able to find uh, what we like to call mechanical sympathy. So what is the, uh, the right type of um, you know, instances in terms of like IOPS and uh, RAM and CPU to really drive the best out of your applications? Because we've got a lot of different instance types. We've got memory optimized, CPU optimized, storage. We've got bare metal. Your application could run better on any one of those. So how do we quickly experiment and discover that so that you can get the best out of your app? So an example here, and the, the example I've got on the, the left is actually not a bad starting point. It was a pattern that we saw a lot of people use up until sort of fairly recently. SQS is our simple queue service. Uh, essentially, we see people use that where you've got a lot of back-end tasks that you're going to work through in some sort of queue fashion. Um, and I might have a fleet of EC2 instances that are taking tasks off that queue, performing whatever it is my backend job is, and then I might go and store that data into Amazon RDS. All right, so I'm using EC2, I'm using RDS, which is, you know, I don't need to manage the servers, so that's kind of great. And, uh, you know, that queuing mechanism helps make sure that my EC2 fleet isn't necessarily going to be flooded. We'll just chug through that backlog as we go. But you've still got potential under a model like this where those EC2 instances could be sitting idle. That database could be sitting idle and not doing anything, and you're still paying for that infrastructure. So we actually deployed a feature, it was uh, probably a couple of months ago now, uh, where SQS can now actually natively call Lambda. So when you put objects in your queue, you can have Lambda functions run specific pieces of code, and you can dictate how many of them run concurrently and configure all that sort of stuff. And then maybe I go and store my data in DynamoDB. So both Lambda, I'm paying for compute by the millisecond, right? Uh, sorry, by the 100 milliseconds, correct that one. Uh, so groups 100 milliseconds. And DynamoDB, I pay for my read and write activity, right? So I uh, scale up to certain numbers of read units and write units based off what my actual data needs are for that application. So that gives me a really great way to go through and optimize that and minimize the waste in terms of what's happening on the compute front, reduce my costs, and improve reliability because in this case, um, the reliability of the DynamoDB service and Lambda service, they're our job. Right? Our job as AWS is to keep those services up and running for you. So you don't need to worry about patching those EC2 instances or managing those. You just say, I've got some code, I've got some data, make it go. So the last pillar we're going to talk about is the cost optimization pillar, because um, who doesn't love saving money? And this is something that we, you know, it's probably one of the fun parts of my job. If I rock up to a customer, find a way to save them a few grand a month, I'm going to go back and get a high five from my boss. Right? I love that. 
So we really do like to talk to customers around how you can optimize what you're doing from a cost perspective. So making sure you're using the most cost-effective resources for your instances, making sure you're matching supply and demand. So that previous example around uh, the EC2 versus Lambda. Um, do you have awareness of your expenditure? Where's your bill? Where's it at currently? Where's it forecasting to be? And are you optimizing over time? You know, is cost something that you want to track and try to trend downward on? And if so, what are the processes you're putting in place to help drive that behavior? So talking to cost optimization, some themes that come up here are around adopting a consumption model. And this is often quite challenging for some organizations because you're very used to this whole, if I need computers, I go out and I buy computers and I figure out how I'm going to use them throughout the life of their, their hardware cycle and, and we go from there. Moving to a consumption model where you pay as you go, month to month, and if you stop using it, you stop paying for it, is a very different sort of mindset to adopt. Being able to benefit from the economies of scale. So this is something that we talk to as AWS quite a lot in terms of we're doing things at a tremendous scale and that allows us to help drive uh, essentially cost reduction for you guys. Since we started, we've reduced costs over 60 times in the last 12 years, largely unprompted, just because we find ways to be more efficient and provide services to you guys cheaper. But also, we'll give you discounts the further you go if you scale up and you start using a lot of a particular service. All of our pricing di di bleh, dictates where you start getting discounts at certain uh, levels. Stop spending money on data center operations. Right? Who likes spending money on keeping the power on, the air conditioning on, the networking going into your data center? All, right? all of this is stuff that we can uh, look at you know, minimizing down or potentially getting rid of when you go all in on the cloud. Uh, being able to analyze and attribute expenditure. This one I spent a lot of time with customers on, being able to talk to how do I figure out how much I'm spending and what I'm spending it on. So not just looking at the bills, but how we're carving those up to be able to attribute it to different systems or different business areas. Um, driving your architecture using data. So again, taking cost as a data point. Let's not just look at physical performance and what's going on. Let's look at the cost of an application and compare that to what we're getting out of it. And being able to use managed services to help reduce the total cost of ownership. Right? RDS is a great example of that. If I don't have to worry about patching the RDS servers or the backups because they're built into it there, that's less time that my DBAs need to spend on that, which frees them up to do more activities that can add value to my business, which is going to ultimately build into a better TCO when I start looking at the, the whole picture. So understanding your costs, just to, to drive down on that one a little bit. Um, first of all, we talk to customers about, you know, do you understand what the cost of each service is? Right? Are you even aware of it when you're building out an architecture? We talk to what is the cost per hour of certain things. But we start talking about tagging as a really great mechanism here to be able to understand what you're doing. So tagging is something that applies to pretty much, I'm not going to say every AWS resource, but a lot of them. And I could do things like tagging them for a specific project. So I know how much money that project has spent based on the resources that have been tagged with Project Iron Man. Uh, how much each department, so how much did the accounts department systems cost me this month? All right, so having a tagging strategy that lets you meet your cost reporting goals is something that you're going to want to get in place sooner rather than later, if, particularly if you're doing any kind of chargeback or showback to the business. Um, but the last bit on there is you know, we display the costs as you go. Right, we also forecast costs. I can set up an alert that says, tell me when my bill looks like it's going to go over X. So if I get to day 10 in the month and it's forecasting to go above that, I can get an alert well before the end of that month. So being able to make sure you've got those right alerts in place so that if things are going south on you from a cost perspective, you get to it sooner rather than later and can respond appropriately. All right, so let's wrap up here and, and talk about what does your journey to well-architected look like? So just sort of summarizing what we've covered off. Um, Well-architected is a strategy of best practices for you running your applications in the cloud. Um, they're questions to allow you to measure yourself against our best practices and make informed decisions about what you do with it. Um, the questions are just a starting point. There is no binary yes or no for most of these. You know, things like, am I using an MFA on my root account? That's pretty yes or no. But when I start talking to questions around, you know, are we auto-scaling? How are we doing our DR? They're not questions that have a yes or no answer, and they're not questions that might necessarily drive a specific behavior based on your type of workload. It really is about getting that conversation started amongst your broader team so that you've got a really solid understanding of how you work and why you work the way you work. 
So it really is getting that going, and it's an ongoing process. So we like to see customers go in and do these you know, more often. Maybe you do it every year on particular workloads or more frequently on things that are critical. Um, as I said, you're capable of doing these yourselves. So it can be an internal exercise and a really great way to get your teams aware of what everybody's doing. So just wrapping up, the URL there, uh, adibus.amazon.com slash wellarchitected has all of our white papers. It has pillar specific white papers that go a lot deeper. Um, and we also have some free online trainings, some videos that talk to the well-architected review and uh, go into a little bit more detail than I've covered off in this session. So worth having a look at those as well. Um, we've got a couple of specific lenses uh, which are tailoring the sets of questions around our high-performance computing and our serverless applications. So just really to narrow down on some of those. Um, but my call to action for you as I'm wrapping up and, and out of time at the moment, go and download those white papers. Right? They're all there, they're free, you can download them in PDF or put them on your Kindle. Um, and have a look at what workloads you've got that you could run these on. Um, and in particular, if you're interested in getting us to help you run one of them, come and have a conversation with me. I would love to talk to you guys. Um, I will likely be around here for another couple of minutes, but otherwise I'll be at the uh, dev lounge at the back of the AWS booth for the rest of the day. But uh, other than that, thank you guys. There's my contact details. Uh, enjoy the rest of Public Sector Summit.